So I'm very, very pleased to open this, um, this very special webinar on higher education and its engagement with uh, SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, and to partner with uh, UNODC uh, for this uh, special webinar on such an important topic. Uh, before going any further, I would like to give the floor to Lulu Assad from UNODC and to open the floor to a very fruitful conversation today. So Lulua, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today with um, actually our dear partners from uh, the International Association of Universities. And it's been really a wonderful a partnership, but most importantly, today is an important day as we uh, basically mark the end of this um, uh, partnership uh, to develop, you know, the research papers. But I don't see it as the end of it, but I actually I see it also as the beginning of something greater. And it is really wonderful to um, have all of um, the researchers here and the participants to also. Uh, remind us of the importance of research and higher education as well in promoting the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so just to take us a step back, when, um, when we forged this important partnership with the International Association of Universities, um, we, we looked together at how we could foster and empower researchers and young researchers on researching on topics that are related to the rule of law and how such research could help us also advance uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and in UNODC, we're very committed also to uh, the sustainable development goals and particularly to uh, SDG 16 and SDG 4. So uh, five, six years ago, we launched the Education for Justice initiative, which aimed at <laughs> working with the young generation, working with the future, um, uh, academic uh, leaders, with policymakers, with uh, researchers, with with the different stakeholders uh, to promote education on issues that are related to the rule of law, which, as all of you know, it's part of our day to day lives. And we launched the initiative and we've reached um, by September almost two million beneficiaries worldwide from children, youth, academia, and all of the other uh, different stakeholders in the education setting, whether it's formal and informal. And um, now as we, we moved, we, are, we worked for six years on this initiative together with valuable partners like the International Association of Universities, UNESCO, uh, the private uh, sector, and also inter uh, civil society organizations and youth-led associations. And this really, for me, this, the important message is that without multi-stakeholder partnerships, we cannot really advance the sustainable development goals. And this is why partnerships with um, different uh, constituencies, partnerships as well with academia, with researchers is really of valuable importance to bring really the positive change and to really implement the sustainable development goals and to particularly accelerate it uh, in light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Of course, now at you know DC, we are going through um, many important issues that are now uh, coming in the agenda. One of them, of course, is the issue of uh, fighting corruption and of strengthening also the fight against corruption, which has uh, been recognized recently by the General Assembly in the political declaration, um, as well uh, on uh, our joint responsibility to countering corruption. And there, there was an important focus and a strong recognition uh, to the valuable role of education, of research, of training, to fight corruption, to build societies that reject corruption. And um, with this, I would just like also to make a small announcement. And this is something that we really look forward also to engage with uh, various academics and researchers on, that we're also planning on launching a new um, initiative just uh, less than a month from now, which is called the Global Resource for Anti-Corruption Education and Youth Empowerment. And within this um, initiative, we have a specific pillar dedicated to academia and research because we really felt that 
especially with this partnership that research has a strong role to play. Universities are a critical partner in achieving these sustainable development goals. And without such partnership, we won't be able to really advance uh, the role of the higher academic institutions. Um, and with this, I would really like to um, congratulate basically all of the winners uh, to thank our dear partners at the International Association for Universities. Um, thank Isabel Hilige for all of the hard work uh, and also Leonardo, uh, my colleague for the for being the, really the driving engine here at UNO DC and of course to my former colleague uh, Bianca Kopp who actually also formulated this uh, partnership together with the IAU and uh, I look forward to um, hearing the discussions and uh, to actually engage beyond also these research papers and to hear from you how we could move this forward and what do you see the next steps could be to advance, uh, to continue researching on these topics? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice introduction, uh, Lulua. Um, and uh, again, uh, wonderful to have this joint uh, webinar here today. Uh, what is this webinar and what is the context? Um, as the, the, uh, the uh, participants may or may not know, uh, this webinar today forms part of a whole series of uh, webinars that the IEU has launched in the, at the beginning of the pandemic. And it is called the IEU webinar series on the future of higher education. And actually, since the beginning of the, the series, uh, which offers um, freely available webinars on a weekly basis, we have discussed many aspects of uh, the transformation of higher education and as well the um, contribution of higher education to transforming the world in which we live. And so the, the resonance of this webinar today and its topic is absolutely essential and, and really is, um, is, is right on spot. What can higher education contribute to uh, transforming the world in a, into a more peaceful, more just, and a more strong, um, strongly rooted in strong institutions kind of society. So the webinar series is, is, the, is the, the background against which uh, we are, are working here. And in that webinar series, we have um, a series of, of uh, strands. Uh, we actually have four. One of the strands is to focus more specifically on leadership and transformative leadership. The second one is on the transformation of internationalization of higher education. The third one is on the digital transformation of higher education. And the fourth one is on sustainable development and the strong role of higher education. The, these are the four key priority areas of work of the International Association of Universities. And in particular, this trend welcomes this webinar. The IU has been working in uh, the field of um, higher education for sustainable development, which we've turned into a field actually, since the early 1990s when the Brundtland uh, Declaration was adopted and uh, with a view to uh, enhancing uh, the role of higher education in advancing um, a more uh, towards a more sustainable uh, world. So since the adoption of Agenda 2030, um, transforming our world, the UN Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, we've stepped up our action. You see it behind me, the wheel is everywhere. You will see it also in the, uh, in the, the publication itself. Um, uh, we decided to engage the global higher education community for the goals. And so we invited universities from the five continents to step forward and to suggest to become a lead for each of the SDGs. And we've um, had an incredible turn up of wonderful universities from big and small, uh, from bigger and larger and smaller countries from all around the world to really uh, foster further attention to the different SDGs. On SDG 16, we work in particular with the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And that university is again working with um, a very nice uh, group of universities, again from the five continents, to work on SDG 16 in particular. So our focus was there already. And then we met with colleagues from UNODC 
uh, with their beautiful project E4J, and we were very pleased to um, have the opportunity to to already get to know each other, to learn how we would work together. And this project came out of that very nice cooperation, and we see it come to fruition today through um, through this publication that we launched today, but also by welcoming all the incredible authors from around the world to the table uh, with us. So in the context of that work, there's much more happening, but I think this is a very nice flagship project that, um, that really was supported financially also by, uh, by Qatar, and we thank them for that. And it allowed us to, um, to issue a call to young researchers around the world to um, actually show how higher education, and in particular how research in higher education and how young researchers in higher education contribute to um, addressing the various issues that are identified under a very important goal, SDG 16. More than uh, 50 applicants uh, came to the IAU uh, with um, a um, dual team, a joint team between UNODC and the IAU. We selected 40 abstracts where people could submit a proposal for a paper and out of those proposals we selected 19. And today we're very pleased to, um, and to have uh, the opportunity to present to you the, um, the, the awardees, those who act, whose papers actually have gone through the whole selection process. Um, and we've come to 12 excellent papers from, uh, from 10 different countries from the different continents with perspectives on um, uh, SDG 16 that are really unique. And we really hope that this publication that we launched today will be only a start of much more discussion on um, how higher education can contribute to SDG 16 and how indeed we can foster uh, peace in the minds of people to take a, um, a sentence from UNESCO, uh, where we're based, um, really through uh, better educating people into the future and, and transform the world in which we live. So we're very pleased to have all the authors with us today. Not all of them wished to speak or could speak. Um, so for a variety of reasons, because some were traveling, so um, difficulty of, of uh, ensuring a stable connection or connection issues at large or for various reasons, but um, all the same, they're with us um, and they may come in also for the, for the chat uh, towards the end. So we will start by announcing the winners of, um, of the, the project and also those papers that have been selected for the publication um, that we will launch today. Before doing so, I would also like to thank all those who have been so instrumental in making the project come to fruition, help us through the selection process. Uh, all the names are in the book, you will be able to access uh, a little later. And also for all those who helped uh, through editing, uh, editing the papers, going back to the authors, uh, helping them along the way, um, and, and this real conversation that already started prior to the, to the publication itself. And as well for all those who helped finalize the publication, including um, the, the designer <laughs> who offers um, a very nice um, vitrine, as we would say in French, to these papers that we hope will travel the world and offer uh, the authors the opportunity to in engage in many more conversations way beyond today. Um, and we hope it will help them a little bit in their career as well, if uh, <laughs> that's at least what UNODC and the IAU would hope, because um, you are really exceptional and um, your papers are worth reading. So I hope they don't stay on any virtual or real shelf, but that people will read them and that definitely uh, they will find their way into the future. And so to not stop there, and in case people skip, slip out of the room too early, I would like to thank Isabel Thoman for her wonderful work. So what do we do here? We start with uh, announcing the, the winners of, um, of the, the, the award, and you will see the topics are very diverse. The, the, the countries where people come from are very diverse, and so are the kind of institutions they write out of. <laughs> and we've decided to actually take turns in out announcing these wonderful people. 
So I will start and thank you, uh, Isabel, there as well for helping move us through it so that you can see also the different uh, si kinds of topics that have been uh, debated and uh, who the winners are. So let's start. <laughs> The first winner for the first part of the book, which is sub-theme one, touching on inequality, sustainable recovery, and SDG 16. There we've, um, we've selected three papers of, uh, of great interest. The first one is by Ruth Okara from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And she touches on uh, the contributions of SDG 16 to a sustainable reco recovery in light of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I see there is a little I missing there, but you will have understood. The second um, recipient is uh, Fatima Mehmud from the Center for Human Rights at the University uh, College Lahore in Pakistan and currently working at Harvard University in the United States. And she looked at, uh, at it at the topic from a different angle and looked at bridging the digital divide also during the pandemic uh, and how a right to internet access and the path towards sustainability and education is so very important to ensure for the many to uh, benefit from education and also contribute to the future. The third winner in this, um, in this category, if I, might, I may say, on inequality, sustainable recovery and uh, SDG 16 is Mateus uh, Reno Santos from the University of South Florida in the US. And he looked at how changing uh, the economic inequality impacts homicide trends, a longitudinal analysis across 126 countries from 1990. To 2017. So already a very broad range of topics being touched on. So Lulua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, pleasure for, to announce also the paper by uh, Shamin Ozerali and Helena Hukomising uh, from Mauritius from the Institute of Education. And the, the paper is on strengthening teacher education for the promotion of ecological social justice in Mauritius. Thank you. And the second one, um, I mean, the second one for me, <laughs> you already might have said it before. So it's uh, the prosecution of environmental crimes in the United States, establishing a baseline using comparative analysis by Monique Sosonovsky uh, from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, New York, the United States of America. And now uh, by uh, Imad Antoine Ibrahim from the College of Law, Qatar University, uh, the state of Qatar. And the paper is on the importance of international corruption law and international environmental law to achieving sustainable development goal 16, an analysis of global instruments addressing environmental corruption. Yes, and so these papers are really looking at uh, the environment, at legal frameworks, and how that translates uh, when, when you look at uh, the various aspects of uh, SDG 16. The third sub-theme is a bit, uh, collected more papers even, uh, and there uh, both Leonardo uh, Paradiso and Isabel Toman will present uh, the recipients of, uh, of the awards. And this sub-theme looked at challenges to peace and sustainable societies. And again, the link to sustainable development goal 16. So the floor is yours, Leon Leonardo. Thank you, Hilja. Uh, first of all, yes, my name is Leonardo. I work with the UNDC and it's a great honor for me to take part in this uh, celebration of uh, um, excellence in the field of uh, research. So without further ado, the um, winners in the sub-theme three of the grants program are the uh, following. First, uh, the uh, paper from Bethlehem Metaferia Gebre uh, Mariam of the Havasa University College of Law and Governance of Ethiopia. She worked on uh, a specific case of Ethiopian universities. Uh, are they accelerating or calming ethnic conflict? Secondly, the uh, paper uh, by uh, Roderick Ndi, University of Chang of Cameroon, uh, titled Anti-Corruption Measures Adopted by Higher Institutions of Learning in Cameroon. And 
the uh, paper written by Laura Pahon, the Montfort University of Leicester, Universe of the uh, United Kingdom, ending human trafficking and all forms of exploitation through multi-agency collaborations. Thank you, Leonardo. So I will continue here. It's um, a pleasure really to announce all the winners and to present the publication today. Um, this is also still sub team three. So we had a lot of very diverse topics um, and it was not that easy to come up with the three um, over um, arching uh, themes there. So I'm just gonna continue with the next paper um, that has been awarded this grant. And the author is um, Fausto Cavaja Glass from the University Anahuac in Mexico. And he wrote a paper on the micro geopolitics of violent non-state actors, a first approach. The second paper in the subsection is by Alwell Akibe from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Building back better in the post COVID world, the role of academic researchers and youth peace builders in Nigeria and South Africa. And the third and final paper or the 12th paper in the whole publication is on the role of universities in ensuring access and justice for all the context of Bangladesh and Nepal by Mostafa Hossein, Prag University, Bangladesh. So really congratulations to all the authors and um, I'm very, very pleased um, to inform you now that my colleague will post the link in the chat and you are exclusively the first um, participants of this webinar to um, be able to download this publication and to read all to all these 12 papers that we have been working on together with our colleagues at UNODC and here at IAU. So it, and the many reviewers that have supported us with academic reviewing. Uh, thank you so much for, for all your support. I saw some of the reviewers as well joining us today in this event. And um, it's really great how we can have this global project um, here together today. The um, winners were announced, if you're wondering, in the order as they are listed in the publication. So we went by topic, there's no specific regional order, but we do have um, almost all world regions represented. So really please, um, I think it should be now available for you. Thank you, Justine, for, for sending the link. Feel free to look at it, read the papers, and also share it with your networks. Um, and it will also go online after this event on the IAU website and social media. But please do stay with us for the second part of this event, because we were saying we are launching a publication, but we also want to discuss and we want to give the authors, if they can, if they would like, the chance to speak a bit about their papers and about this overarching topic of higher education and SDG 16. Um, so I think I will now give the floor back to Hillage van Land, our AAU Secretary General, who will be moderating um, the discussion with the authors and also you will have the chance, all of the participants which would like to engage in the chat, comment, ask questions and use this question and answer button in Zoom. So thank you very much again and Hilic, uh, back to you. I think you're unmuted, sorry. About, yeah, for that. So thank you very much, uh, um, Isabel, Leonardo and Lulua for uh, uh, for your your work on this as well, uh, and for um, for all to all the authors for having the opportunity to uh, to really launch this uh, today. It's been uh, it's always like uh, any publication. I think that you uh, you always uh, hope for the best, and we got the best, so that's really nice. <laughs> and we now can really um, uh, only hope for the book to travel far, as I said earlier. So it was really from the US, from Kenya, from Qatar, from uh, Ethiopia, Cameroon, the UK, Mexico, Nigeria, Bangladesh, very diverse. Um, and we hope that you as, a, as an author team will form a team for the future also to, uh, to engage with each other in further discussions um, and hopefully uh, uh, develop um, a network of practice um, of researchers on topics relating to SDG 16. The topics were incredibly diverse. Um, so um, that was the richness. That's why we chose your papers as well, uh, because they offered so many very nice views on, on, uh, on a theme so broad. Um, and we're very pleased to uh, welcome you here uh, on the screen. So all the authors who are with us, uh, you will be promoted to uh, also having your, your um, 
your uh, camera open and um, and your you know, to the capacity to use the the speaker uh, button and i will go around the room with um four questions um and we will start with the first one will where i will ask a bit uh, here and there who who could respond to it but uh, you've also received a, a preview of the questions and i hope uh, that that will work for you so we wanted to um, uh, all ask you, uh, and in particular, maybe uh, Mateusz, uh, Reno Santos and Fatima Mehmoud, how is your research topic contributing to also achieving the SDGs 16? And how do you see that uh, being fostered by, um, by higher education in particular? So let me start by, uh, with, by inviting Mateusz to respond. Mateusz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this initiative and thank you, Isabel, for the patience. So, uh, in short, my research shows that there has been this global homicide decline happening throughout the world. Very few people know that the homicide decline that their own countries is experiencing is happening internationally. And the main implication of, of this finding that we have this global international homicide decline is that the policies of individual countries, right, what the individual countries did in order to achieve this decline actually probably did not work. And this is very important because in the context of criminal justice, many of these policies are extremely restrictive and extremely damaging. For instance, in the United States, we had mass incarceration, this huge explosion in the use of incarceration by, by more than six times over the past 30 years. And, and my, my research essentially suggests that that did not work because other countries had the same exact decline without such initiatives. And uh, what I show is essentially that this entire international homicide decline is driven by, by a very strong process of population aging, which is changing the world. We're getting older, much, much older over time. But that, however, population aging is also driving uh, uh, another force, another major social force, which is this uh, increase in social inequality in the most developed countries. And what my publication speaks about is, is how uh, we have this unprecedented process of population aging, how it does bring us this benefit or of, of living in a more peaceful society, but it also brings about challenges. And one of these challenges is that it somehow oppresses the youth and that we have to be more active in, in, in supporting the youth through education, uh, through direct uh, direct support as well, and in and, and, and many other ways, because if we don't do that, we're gonna have a society that we have uh, more, uh, you know, which where younger people are less individuals and, and where they don't have enough space uh, to grow, which is already happening in some countries around the world. So education would be a means. Is that what you would say as well in higher education in particular? <laughs> Absolutely. It's a means. And, and another thing is that uh, higher education is all about research. It's all about teaching us the techniques to understand all these processes and trends, right? We should yes. know that uh, whenever I talk to people and I presented on this research uh, throughout the world uh, I and I worked in the you know DC as well whenever you tell people that we are having this international homicide decline people are skeptical they do not believe you uh, because it's very hard to observe these global trends unless you have the right data unless you have the right information actually if you ask people in the streets most people in America in the United States they think the homicides are going up they think it is because of immigration and, and, and they do not understand that immigrants actually do not commit crimes in America because immigrants don't come here to be criminals. Where they want, If they wanted to be criminals, they would stay in their home countries, right? It's much easier. Uh, so there's a lot of ignorance in regards to the topic of criminal justice. And, and the only way to, to you know, enlighten that ignorance is through education. So I teach my students and, and they're very surprised when I say that the United States has the highest incarceration rate of the planet. How come, if this is the land of the free, how come we have so many incarcerated people? And we realize that has historical roots and a lot of it's based on uh, racial relationships as well. So it's very complicated as always. So very, th thank you. Thank you also for making the case for better data, better information and um, um, eradication of fake news, maybe. <laughs> that awesome. is also a very big topic there, but we can come, come back to you. But Fatima, um, may I ask you the same question? How is your research topic contributing to achieving the SDG 16? Yeah, so there are two broad ways in which my research contributes to achieving SDG 16. My research is basically centered on mainstreaming a right to internet access within the existing human right to education, both in international human rights law and in the domestic Pakistani system. 
And as I analyzed in my research through a comparative study with other countries, there are four main methods of entrenching and um, really protecting this right in domestic systems. And those are through constitutionalization, through legislative enactment, through the judiciary, and then through more informal public policy framework. So as I was saying, there, there are two broad ways in which all of this uh, coincides with the goals of SDG 16. The first is simply that SDG 16 seeks to protect fundamental freedoms. And this research topic would seek to reimagine and reinterpret an existing human right, seeks to do precisely that, that um, in the sense that it seeks to protect not just the right to education, but through protecting the right to education, a bunch of other ancillary, interdependent subsidiary rights. So for example, the right to earn a living, um, the right to vote, the right to be free from uh, discrimination, and a bunch of other connected rights. So that's, that's the first way in which this research topic is connected to SDG 16. The second way is through SDG 16's focus on promoting sustainability through non-discrimination. So the idea behind my research topic is a recognition of the digital divide specifically in education and the means to overcome that digital divide through legal frameworks and through policy frameworks, both on the domestic and on the international um, front. So what I argue basically in my paper is that these inequalities and this level of discrimination, these predated the pandemic and these pre-existed um, even before COVID-19. But what COVID basically has done is that it has acted as a catalyst in exacerbating those inequalities and just, you know, um, uh, steepening those inequalities between the haves and haves not, have nots of um, digital technology, specifically in education. So in, in trying to mainstream a right to internet access within the existing right to education, the goal really is to mitigate this inequality and this discrimination um, in learning through bridging the digital divide. This is very interesting. You may wish to learn that uh, we're currently in the uh, 41st uh, General Conference of UNESCO. And just this week, uh, UNESCO is adopting um, a new recommendation on open science, which is actually linked to that as well. So open access to more information, open access to uh, uh, the, the, the right to, uh, actually the right to information and high quality um, information. So uh, I think you, you could be connected to that as well to, to some extent. And uh, we will not let you go after this project. <laughs> we will work with you more in the future as well. So. I will, I will now first turn to the second question before coming back to you uh, at, um, at a later point uh, in the webinar. So the second question is really about, according to you, how can higher education support the rule of law and sustainable development? And uh, we've invited uh, Laura Pajon, uh, Shamin Ouzirayli, uh, and Mostafa Hossein. And apologies for any mispronunciation of your name. Please say it better than I do when you take the floor. But um, I invite you uh, in turns to pick up on this question. So Laura, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Laura and I'm a lecturer here at the Monfu University. Um, I think that actually the higher education have a very important role to target any sustainable development goal and any complex uh, reality. I think that all the projects that we've, you know, that you've just uh, announced the winners, all of them try to target very, very complicated, complex and multidisciplinary projects. Uh, realities um, and I think that higher education have the potential through the research and through evidence-based knowledge to inform responses to those complex realities. Um, in my paper I talk about how collaboration between academics and uh, different stakeholders from police forces, local authorities, um, non-governmental agencies, it can make a massive difference to build new and more innovative solutions to those um, realities, um, as well as much more long-term uh, solutions that are targeting those problems uh, through process that are not just one goal, but actually it can have much meaningful transformative um, solutions. Um, how it also can target, I think, higher education, um, 
there's the possibility of involving students as well within this uh, action towards um, responding to sustainable development goals. Uh, there are different uh, communities that we as higher education can engage with. Um, so yeah, I think that the whole potential is on that, on the research that it can create, but also on how um, higher education can uh, disseminate those findings and engage with different communities to apply the different research findings. Wonderful, thank you indeed. Uh, millions of people who access uh, higher education are still a fringe of society, but those already can contribute, as you say, and um, they uh, need to be called to the table even better than they are today. Uh, a big uh, intergovernmental uh, organizations or governmental organizations like UNESCO, this is um, um, a practice that is uh, increasing. The International Association of Universities always tries to have this focus by involving many more students and the different stakeholders around uh, uh, the higher education landscape uh, to take the, the floor. But certainly uh, you highlighted important points there on how HE is to support the rule of law and sustainable development. Shamin, can I invite you to take the floor? Merci Hidike, merci Isabelle et merci pour cet événement et je vais passer en anglais. Uh, so one of the defining traits of academia and higher education is to develop criticality in the form of what Morin calls dialogical awareness, the thought processes that allow us to simultaneously criticize and mutually understand ourselves. And I believe that the first step towards supporting the rule of law and sustainable development is by being critical of the notion of sustainability and sustainable development, to refocus it around an anthropoharmonic, critically holistic epistemology as part of actively challenging the status quo and simultaneously providing quality education, which also leads to SDGs 12 to 15. One of the central values, for instance, simple value also, is the awareness that we humans are simply sharing the planet with other species and we are responsible for the health of the planet. This is what Morin also calls ecological awareness. By inculcating these critical and ethical values in educators, future educators and the younger generation, we can hope that they become empowered citizens who embody these values of critical sustainability, who participate and engage constructively and responsibly in society and thus, by extension, automatically align with the rule of law. From a very idealistic view, I would like to say that this may contribute to making situation or repression obsolete. Thank you. Merci beaucoup uh, de très très bons points que vous avez soulevé. Um, so indeed very important this whole value-based higher education that you're talking about. Uh, and also this notion of uh, you have many rights, but you have many responsibilities as well. So that's a, a very important point. And uh, the whole um, critical thinking dynamics that is being challenged in too many countries around the world nowadays, yet is so fundamental to advance our teaching, learning, research and uh, community engagement. Uh, I also liked your dialogical awareness uh, point of view. Uh, so thank you for that. I will. So we will get back to that in the overall conversation towards the end, but first I would like to give the floor to Mustafa Hossein. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity of this competition and this presentation. Uh, I thank Isabel for, uh, uh, for uh, the regular continuation of communications on the issues to make it a successful venture. Uh, I focused on target three of goal 16, which talks about access to justice. I mean, equal access for all. Uh, the term itself denotes that equality is a precondition in order to ensure access to justice. But the nations I dealt with, uh, there is a very serious challenge about access to justice itself. And then comes to equal access to justice. When the discrimination is embedded at the root of the legal systems, then question arises about the equal access to justice. Now, how can you ensure that? You need resources, resources in terms of manpower, resources in terms of institutional facilitations. Now, the two countries I dealt with having, uh, you know, more than uh, 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 millions of people and uh, their lack of educational institutions, particularly at the higher level, is really very challenging for us to deal with such issues. Therefore, my first argument was to incorporate uh, access to justice, the concept and SDG goal uh, in line with it in the 
the modus operandi of the teaching system because we have as students and as we made the target of 2030 as the threshold year to uh, achieve the SDG goals, I think teaching the largest number of students in this regard will help them to grow as young minds to be determined towards ensuring access to justice for all. As young lawyers, they will be able to pursue this path. This is one argument. Secondly, in order to make sure that how far we have progressed and to what extent we need to progress more, of course, the second dimension in the education, higher educational institutions requires doing extensive research on these issues and finding out to what extent we need to move further and what are the catalysts we need to adopt. And then after I also argued about building partnership with other uh, institutions, organizations and NGOs related to who are advocating for human rights, equality for all. In, in, I mean, starting with the United Nations different agencies so that we really can do something and can contribute something in this regard. Now, uh, building or uh, bringing all these issues into account, uh, my core point is that access to justice can only be ensured when you have enough resources. However, I found that law schools, uh, I mean, all the universities do not have legal education. That's why I also thought that legal education providing to all is important. I mean, all uh, open for all the uh, students so that they can avail it. So that's how I developed the arguments. Thank you. Thank you for that important paper co comparing uh, the situation in Bangladesh and Nepal, or even considering a part uh, at times and making the case for something that is not only true for Bangladesh and Nepal, but way beyond. Uh, very important for people to read, uh, not only as a case study uh, per pertaining to one part of the world, but uh, much more broadly so. Equal access to justice or access to justice are two different things. And you pinpoint those uh, very eloquently. So thank you for that. And uh, as well, the important emphasis you put on the, the need to build um, innovative partnerships between different kind of uh, players, uh, not only on, in the field of justice or, or uh, the field of, of uh, particular study, but in the field of higher education, but in society at large. And uh, that is also related, obviously, to uh, the goal 17, uh, partnerships for the goals. And I think that that needs to be embedded um, at all levels. Um, and the next question is, is a bit, um, is looping back to many of the things that uh, the speakers so far have uh, already um, uh, shared. Uh, but please uh, use also the the, um, the ideas that uh, your colleagues have uh, already um, uh, brought to the conversation. And um, the question is then, why is the role of young scholars in tertiary education crucial for your research and for the Agenda 2030 at large? So I've heard a few um, uh, hints at, uh, at answers to that question already, but I give the floor back to you, Mateusz uh, Santos. Could you please repeat the question? Why is the role of young scholars and of higher education as such uh, of um, great importance first for your research and then um, of importance for uh, Agenda 2030 and the best way to actually um, respond to the global goals? So, um... One thing we always hear in, in here in the United States, and I'm from Brazil, but I, I currently work in the United States, is that data is the new oil. So if you go around and, and you just uh, talk to people, you're going to have several intuitions and opinions that really drive a lot of the po policy making. A lot of the policy making we still have regarding the, some of the world's most severe problems, such as crime and justice, they're still based on, on individuals' opinion and on, on political trends and to some extent on, on public opinion that is shaped by a lot of false information and that's interfered with by a lot of false information and we can see nowadays that that uh, uh, those individuals being influenced by false information uh, from Facebook and, and so forth and a lot of it is based on ignorance and that ignorance we, we tend to think it doesn't affect us but it does and it shapes policy and, and shapes the discussion and, and that's why we're seeing so much hate 
and, and so much controversy regarding things that really aren't controversial. And the only way to, to elucidate that as, is by doing high quality data-driven evidence-based policies and research. And um, they're not being done enough and we, we need more researchers, more people, more scholars, especially in a comparative perspective. Why? Because nowadays we do have these global trends that are very, very, we don't understand enough. They're very misunderstood and that are, they are really driving a lot of the social changes we're witnessing or we are feeling. And, and, but most people simply do not understand that they exist. They tend to link uh, whatever is happening to them to local phenomenon. And we do know that oftentimes this is based on a lot of you know, misguided information. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, more plea uh, indeed for much better data and also for dissemination and, and making these data available to the to the larger public. Um, uh, Fatima, I will give you the floor in a second, but maybe Roderick, since you're with us, uh, same Imad, uh, Antoine Ibrahim uh, from Qatar and Owell Akigbe uh, from Nigeria, since you're with us, maybe you would wish to have the floor in a minute after we listen to Fatima. So Fatima first and then uh, maybe uh, Imad, you already were ready <laughs> to take part in the conversation. So Fatima. Yeah, so I, I think the question has a bunch of different layers to it. Um, so I, I just like to break it down and address it um, separately. So firstly, about the role of young scholars and the role of tertiary education as far as my research is concerned. So the role is at, at the heart of my research and it, it's a very key component of what I'm working towards. When we talk about the idea of a new human right um, or of reimagining or reinterpreting an existing human right, we're, we're essentially talking about a change and we're talking about a paradigm shift, a drift from the status quo. So wherever a change is involved, I feel like, um, especially with some of the other more pressing issues of our times, like climate change, um, wherever change is involved, youth, young scholars, tertiary education should be key stakeholders in sort of shaping the discourse around that change. So when we talk about reinterpreting an existing human right or bringing a new, new human right to the forefront, it's very important to take the voices of those who are going to be most impacted by this human right in the near future. And we also have to understand, um, secondly, that this problem of the digital divide that my paper seeks to address, it's, it's not a historical problem and it's not even just a today problem. So it's not even a present day problem. It's more than anything, a very intergenerational future problem that we need to mitigate and we need to preempt this problem from the get-go before it manifests itself into a full-blown um, emergency situation which we then as an international community cannot tackle. So the idea is to have the youth shape this discourse, not just for today, but also for the future, because it's going to be the, these youth, this young scholars, people enrolled in tertiary education who are going to become future leaders, and it's only if their voices are heard now that they can really shape what's coming out um, of, of this whole discourse in um, later times. And secondly, so not, not just the intergenerational effects of this, but I also feel like th there are a lot of reverberating effects um, coming out of this right to internet access and this right to education. And because it affects so many other things, it's extremely important uh, the role of young scholars and the role of tertiary education uh, more generally as well. And I completely agree with what one of uh, the winners said earlier during the question, that it's, it's also about incorporating this idea of legal education for all students and not, not just for law students. And I, I go so far as to say that legal, legal education should be, you know, mandatory component, not just in tertiary education, but also before that. So that it, it becomes a part of the learning process and it's not something that you know um, pops out randomly or suddenly. So I think that's um, that's that's a very uh, important point to take on. Yeah. So you're advocating actually for a whole of institution approach to the SDGs and to to SD in general and this these topics of uh, uh, of um, well peace, justice, and strong institutions, and also for a whole system approach. 
And it's interesting, that's again, uh, very dear to the very work of the International Association of Universities. Um, Imad Ibrahim uh, Qatar, you wish to take the floor. Yeah, hi, thanks, uh, thanks for, the, for this conference and for everybody's uh, contributions. Um, I'm speaking from personal experience because in the last few weeks and even months, we've been dealing with this issue where we are having like different emerging scholars in various fields con uh, addressing SDGs, trying to collaborate together to try to figure out the best way to uh, achieve these SDGs. And I found that there are many issues, but at the same time, uh, advantages for having these kind of conversations. Mostly that emerging young scholars are in a situation where they sort of understand the new topics emerging, be it, for instance, I, would, I can give fast an example, which is the use of technology in SDGs. For instance, the use of AI when it comes to uh, sustainable development goals, be it water or food, whatever that is. Uh, I, I could see that, for instance, these emerging scholars have a better grasp of technology than uh, more experienced scholars. And so we could have seen, I've seen many of initiatives where actual legal results and innovative ideas came out from these kinds of con contributions and collaborations. Uh, and these collaborations and contributions were also interesting for senior scholars later on to use in their research. So I could see how, uh, for instance, the tech savvy nature of emerging scholars can be used to try to advance uh, certain issues concerning SDGs. That's just one kind of remarks I, I've seen. The second one is simply creating a network of connection between all the emerging scholars, because we all are emerging scholars. We're looking to create our own networks um, and push towards in the future, hoping the hope that we become established scholars in each of our respective fields. And so this is one way to push forward in this regard and to add, explore different ways of collaboration and the hope of also connecting different institutions uh, working on SDGs. These are just, just wanted to mention these two as remarks in this regard. Thank you. Very important points uh, as well. Uh, all well, Akikbe, would you like to also contribute your thoughts to this discussion? Thank you, Algeria. So a uh, really interesting conversation so far. And what really comes to mind in terms of my own research was I focused on identifying the roles that youth peace builders and academic researchers can play in driving post-COVID-19 recoveries in Northern South Africa. So for that research, I already zeroed in on these two countries because they are two of the biggest economies in Africa and also two of the most impacted by COVID-19. One of the things that really struck me about, um, about in terms of like findings, which I want to emphasize in terms of research, the role of research in driving you know, sustainable development goals to the is really the fact that researchers should take the lead in providing evidence-based research um, for promoting post-COVID-19 recovery. Now, I say this because um, I think the current topic dynamics are really changing. In the last one and a half years of COVID has really um, exacerbated tensions in places where most of us do our work in terms of conflict, in terms of research around conflict and peace building. So one thing that came out strongly for, for my research when, when interacting with peace builders, youth peace builders and academic researchers in Nigeria and South Africa, was first the need to ensure citizen-centered security security sector responses. So in terms of um, responses by the states in Nigeria and South Africa towards COVID-19, most of it was high-handed. Most of it um, saw, we saw really ridiculous situations whereby um, COVID wasn't actually, at the very beginning, security forces were killing more people than COVID was actually killing in, in these two countries. So the responses were very high-handed, were top, uh, top down. They didn't include a whole lot of community-centered responses and I feel like this is an area, and again, this is as COVID begins to wane and we enter the post COVID 19 recovery period. This is also something that has really become top on the agenda, and particularly in these two countries and across Africa. How do we ensure that security forces are much more, um, yeah, are much more accountable to the community? The second thing that came out in terms of the role for researchers, uh, in terms of like an area for us to research, really, is ensuring like conflict sensitive responses um, to, to COVID 19. In, at least in these two countries where I work in the city of Africa as well. This is because it was really key for my respondents. It was key that the government, before going on to carry out um, blanket lockdowns um, without providing sufficient palliatives or without ensuring the security of people um, who live, who mostly work within the informal economy and were badly affected by these lockdowns. 
what should have happened we should, should have been a good proper consultation of these communities, the proper needs analysis and stakeholder matters to really understand what exactly are the best ways to go around protecting the community from COVID-19 and simultaneously not exacerbating tensions and thereby contributing to the SDP system. So that was something that really did come out. But my major emphasis would be for researchers to ensure that we are producing evidence-based research that is contextually um that's contextually I say dynamic now in that sense that it's it's, it's plugged to the times in which we live in and that can be of most use to the local populations. The second thing that came out, which I think is also helpful for higher education to take out, is the fact that we need to pro propagate the ideals of SDG 16 beyond the formal educational sector. So I was privileged to interview um and a UNODC Education for Justice 2017 champion um, in Nigeria. And then during that process, she really did emphasize the fact that um, initiatives such as the E4G are really exciting and then they are, they are really good. But unfortunately, the scope is really narrow and it's still up towards people or people within the formal educational system who may have one or two, who may be inclined, anyways, to just go in, in that route and might not need so much emphasis. What unfortunately, uh, it's lacking is the fact that the non-formal educational system is usually left out in terms of um, targets population for SDG 16 education. So I know this isn't very easy to pull off. I understand that universities, higher education is used to working within a structured educational system. And then there's also the idea of mapping out the non-formal sector. But I dare say that the most important um, target population that would most benefit from SDG 16 education would be the non-formal system vulnerable youth populations and local populations as well marginalized groups these are the kind of people that we need to be targeting if we want to be able to achieve um the sdgs all the 17 sdgs by 2030 i feel like we need to widen the scope of education to to inform our educational system thank you Thank you very much. So you're really making the case for the for the local relevance and the local mission of higher education. Uh, also, uh, a theme that is has come much higher on the agenda of the International Association of Universities, um, and also this uh, desire to uh, link up much more with non formal education is very important, uh, as this is probably uh, also linked to all the the work that's being done on different continents when it comes to community engagement. Um, and, and uh, sharing of uh, the opportunities of higher education with the, with the, with the many. I'm uh, obviously not doing justice entirely to, uh, to all the points that you made, but those points are also indeed um, very important for the higher education sector to connect with other education forms um, in, in, in different forms and, and shapes. Then the fourth question, uh, before we get some questions in the, in the Q&A, I hope from the participants, um, I would like to ask uh, if, um, if you would have recommendations for the higher education leadership um, or recommendations for the government on uh, how to ensure that SDG 16 um, and the different um, dynamics that uh, that are being picked up under goal 16 uh, are being addressed by 2030. Do you think there is a mirac miraculous recipe there <laughs> in the world that is unfortunately facing far too many uh, opposite uh, dynamics. So, Laura, can I give you the floor? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't think that there's any magic. <laughs> but um, in terms of the higher education, I think that one of the key elements is to have a strong commitment to sustainable development goals. Um, and by strong commitment, I mean that there's a commitment to support research projects that are willing to target or address any of those SDGs. Um, Ima has mentioned it before around trying to develop a stronger networks uh, between academics and also with uh, practitioners. So it's about um, higher education supporting those, uh, the development of those uh, networks, uh, the development of partnerships with local and international stakeholders and policymakers, as well as support in the dissemination of findings, as I was uh, referring to before. Um, in terms of the government, um, again, it's about a strong commitment, but also it's about ensuring some um, willingness and commitment to uh, 
collaborate with research as well as to implement research and to dedicate enough resources to target those issues. I was referring before about the complexity and the need for long-term solutions. So it is well having that commitment to support um, a long-term project uh, or projects to respond to those um, or to address the SDGs. I think you're on mute. Uh. Yes, there is a little magic touch somewhere who mutes me in between. So, um, if, uh, Shamim Uzirali, may I give you the floor on this question? Yes, thank, thank you. So one of the first recommendations like Lulua, Laura, and everyone so strongly stated is to continue to promote research. Without research, there is little room for innovation. And research is the means by which our academic voice is given substance, as Fatima also shared, so that change can happen. And more specifically, and this comes from the research that my colleague Helena and I are engaged in, we would recommend the integration of the Eco8 model, and I quote in 2021, into macro and meso level education policy and planning. And the MIE has an important role to play here in Mauritius. Um, the model focuses on generating ecologically responsible, anthropoharmonic, critically holistic, and humane education, which could provide a clear pathway in terms of educational philosophies and theories to ground ecological social justice into the Mauritian education landscape, and by extension into the public domain also. Fundamentally, the recommendation is to not only raise awareness regarding environmental degradation and ecological crime in Mauritius, but to advocate for ecological social justice for people in the land. Rather than seeing from the anthropocentric perspective that Earth is some dead matter to claim, own, sell, develop, and so on, failing to realize that this kind of limitless economic growth is destructive to people, land, air, and sea, we recommend an approach to education that would valorize and inculcate values relating to living in harmony with Earth, being more ecologically conscious and regenerating ecosystems. And the role of language and discourse in shaping how we see the world and interact with the world is essential. Through Ecolinguistics from the writing of Stevie 2021, Ecolinguistics, Language, Ecology, Ecology and the Stories We Live By, we can become more sensitive to how we speak, the words we use and the stories we tell, whether they are beneficial, ambivalent or destructive. And from this, we can continue to, to become more reflective and we can begin to shift our mindsets and values towards ecological social justice. As the writer Ben Opry says, stories are the secret reservoir of values. Change the stories individuals and nations live by and tell themselves, and you change the individuals and nations. Still on mute, I again, again, mute. <laughs> um, who would like to come in on this important point? Uh, recommendations to higher education and recommendations to government. So, Imad, I see your hand up. Um, okay, first thing, we need to uh, promote open government data. We cannot, as researchers or as educators, understand what's the situation without knowing what are the data. And the best way to understand this is to promote open government data. The current problem in, uh, that we have is that a, either governments do not want to provide the data or they don't have the capacity. Because of that, we need to start using new technologies like AI to try to understand how to can get all these government data. Once we have these government data, then we can assess whether they are actually pushing towards the implementation of SDG 16 or not, based on which then we can promote, try to understand, uh, to uh, establish a certain soft, sort of mechanism of compliance similar to the Paris Agreement, where it's going to be more a techno or political mechanism based on which you could help states support them in complying and reaching the goals under SDG 16. But it's a long way to get there. It's very technical what I'm saying, but that's how uh, I see the way to get to that point because governments will not do it themselves. So it has to come initially from civil society to push the government for uh, open government data based on which we as researchers, we can assess whether the governments are going there or not and try to push toward compliance. That's how I see it. Okay, thank you. There was a question in the Q and A uh, about uh, the about the importance of data, but how to address that, and and what's the link uh, or the help that could be thought from uh, artificial intelligence. There is another recommendation from UNESCO coming up. 
um, that you could look into on how to do that. Uh, as well, you call for a total democratization of data. Well, we will see how that works in the future. <laughs> um, then I see a hand up. All well, Akibe. Thanks, Yuge. So I have one recommendation for the government and then one for the research community um, for higher education. So the one for the government would be to provide more unrestricted funding for research in higher education institutes. And this really came out strongly from my interaction with, with academics in Nigeria and South Africa. And this is because oftentimes, um, if whenever there is some form of funding, it's kind of restricted, there's also some form of specific purpose for which it could be used, and even the, the, the final product of the research could also be subject to the prosecution, particularly if that funding is coming from the government. Um, so there has to be a lot more, more unrestricted funding where researchers are free to be able to pursue research interests um, about things broadly to SDG 16. And also, um, this funding also has to be disaggregated um, to the specific needs of a particular university. So, for instance, there was more funding for universities in South Africa from the government than Nigeria. But interestingly, within South Africa, there was less funding for Black um, or historically Black universities in South Africa. So, what are so quote unquote, it's kind of like Ivy League um, South African universities. Most of them got up most of the funding, while supposedly um, universities such as University of Sunula, for instance, which is predominantly Black university, received less of those funding. So for societies that are multiracial and multicultural, the government should be able to, to channel funding appropriately. Now, for researchers of higher education practitioners, I would say that we should go out uh, much more purposefully to form strong networks with local communities um, to actually tackle the issues that matter to them. So there's always this disconnect between the town and the gown. And one reason that made me really want to take up this research and, and juxtapose academic researchers and youth peace builders was really to see how theory was fitting into practice and if practice was fitting back into theory. So I think researchers should be willing to go out a lot more and engage with local communities, find out exactly what issues are uh, pertain to them in terms of SDG 16 and provide research that is aimed towards um, alleviating those issues. Yeah, and create stronger collaborations as well. Uh, so you have you have the topic of your next uh, research there <laughs> and i'm sure you could work with everyone here on screen because it's so important to to do first research in inequality of access to research funding i think uh, it's not exactly that but approximately what you're also calling for so better funding for the appropriate research that is uh, that's needed today um and i think that uh, we hear that everywhere that uh, better understanding of the research funding landscape it would be essential to inform policy development for the future of higher education. Uh, that is something that came out of uh, a series of, of publications uh, and if you're interested you can drop us a line and, and I will share those with you. Um, but um, there is a strong call now internationally to really make sure that the future of higher education is secured through proper support by uh, governments for their higher education systems as key players to get the countries out of uh, the, the, the crisis uh, with multiple S's at the end um, uh, induced by COVID-19, but also available before. And there is an enormous and very strong call for better funding of the higher education system, uh, because a lot of the funding goes into pre-primary, primary, secondary education, and now lifelong, as if higher education can sustain itself. Yet, that is a key uh, uh, part of the chain uh, in the in the whole system. And if higher education is not pro properly first supported and next funded in particular when it comes to research and research of young scholars, then we will have a problem for the future and we'll never be able to uh, address the various um, uh, challenges identified in the UN Agenda 2030. So thank you for that strong plea there as well that I heard in other presentations in various forms and shapes. I don't see another hand up, but would anybody wish to, uh, to say something to that, then please do so. There was another question in the chat by Darla Deerdorf asking, 
what uh, big topics would you see on the agenda of higher education? So um, we need to, to bring it down to uh, issues pertaining to SDG 16 that would make sense for this session in particular. But if you have one uh, topic that you see as, as um, essential moving forward in, uh, in, in reimagining higher education, then please uh, let us know. I think that here we have Roderick um, also connecting. Uh, I hear from Isabel that you have some connectivity issues. So while you're with us, I give you the floor. <laughs> Can you access, can you speak? Can you hear me? Well, I think we can try maybe um, without video and sound, but I think, uh, yeah, Roderick tells me he has unfortunately some problems. Um, so we can, we can try, but it's, we have most, most authors that were able to join us. Some only were, were listening in because also of connectivity issues um, and other commitments, but yeah. I think he, he now. I think he's now um, out again. Sorry about that. Yes, exactly. But but all the all the authors with us uh, on screen and and um, and thank you for uh, staying on with us. Would would you have something to say to that very question? What is what can you and your work also see as as key issues coming up in higher education today? that would uh, require um, specific attention also when it comes to SDG 16. So it's the issues of equality, inequality, it is uh, the notions of sustainability, it's the environment that uh, have been brought forward, um, it's the challenges to peace and sustainable societies, but what other key topics would you see? Um, to, to, to actually complement it, um, at the beginning, uh, Lulu Assad was also uh, alluding to a new project that UNODC is developing, and it will be developed um, uh, to uh, zoom in more specifically, if I may say it so, on uh, the uh, notions of corruption in higher education. Um, is that something that any of you has been working on and is that something that you would deem uh, very important for the future of higher education moving us into um, 2030? Um, would anybody, yes, Mateusz, you have asked the floor. So uh, about your previous question, but that second question is also key. There's a lot of corruption in the higher education, a lot of uh, invented data, a lot of fraud, and of course that's, <laughs> the worst type of, of crimes and it's never ever prosecuted. But about your first question, so what I see is this huge increase in inequality in the developed world. And that's very important for crime because all of the most violent countries in the world, they are extremely unequal and all of the safest countries in the planet, they are highly equal. And this increase in inequality is depending on these new dynamics of economic policies and of population aging. And I feel like if we don't do anything, we're going to, uh, you know, you're going to see a planet, a world that's a lot more unequal than we see nowadays. People are no longer having kids. People are living a long time. They're accumulating a lot of assets and they're transferring those assets to smaller and smaller generations of uh, heirs, heirs and and. Uh, that's a big problem on a global scale, and I feel like we can, we do have tools to address it. And uh, one tool that I, I advocate for, which a lot of people feel is a bit radical, is for a universal basic income on a global scale. Perhaps it sounds a bit extreme, but if we consider that we spend just in the United States, you spend in some states more than fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars per year on an inmate, it makes you wonder whether it would just be easier, more convenient and better, a better use of that money to just give it to people, to let them support themselves, especially during their youth, because it's extremely unfair that, that uh, we have so many subsidies for older age, all the while we let the youth be this private subject of the families. So if you're born to a rich family, you get to be rich forever. But if you're born to a poor family, you are condemned to the same poverty of your ancestors. And we have to break that cycle and it's kind of outrageous that we haven't done so. And, and you can see that on a global scale where you're born and, and to who you're born really pretty much dictates your life. And, and it can really dictate whether you might uh, resort to a, you know, a criminal career or not as well and your risks of victimization. 
Right. So I do think that we should investigate whether that's going to be risky, what's going to be all the consequences of universal basic income. But moving forward, I feel that's the most promising policy that I can think of. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that important uh, question. Um, and so you would see further research on that in higher education, actually. Absolutely. Further research on, you know, instead of we spend so much money building infrastructures to help people. And, and uh, a lot of that money goes to waste. A lot of that money is deviated through corruption. You know, I've, I've worked in governments, you know, in, in Brazil, and I can tell you that there's a lot of people who, you know, just don't work or don't know what they're doing. Oftentimes I feel like, and also like, you know, oftentimes I feel like if we just did not, if we just simplified all that social support infrastructure and we simply gave people a direct deposit in their bank account using a cell phone that a lot of people have and just gave them enough resources to, to survive essentially, I think we could, you know, we could really have a revolution in, in how the world works and, and, and transfer some income from rich people that essentially live out of their own assets and this all these assets they accumulated to uh, uh you know the more more poor people and in, in a way we could change the, the economic dynamics and cater more to to disadvantaged populations than we do nowadays because uh in the united states it's this is unprecedented 70 percent of all assets are held by people who are 70 years or older the united states has never been so unequal as it is today and we are seeing the same exact process in all developed countries they are getting a lot more unequal over time and if we don't do anything they you know we might start to have a real social stability problems and and those includes of course of course crime okay very important points um which call for a lot of uh, research on different uh, social models and uh, social redistribution redistribution models across countries uh, i think this talks also to a point that fatima was making earlier that we need for this value-based education to start very early in the lives of people <laughs> in order for it to be picked up and implemented later um, there was a specific question to you in the chat uh, fatima uh, about the digital divide uh, impacts developing countries more than developed ones. So there is a gap in fairness in how digital technologies are currently distributed globally. And do you think recognition of internet access as a universal human right can really help with reducing the international digital divide and ensure economically disadvantaged nations, especially in terms of educations, are not left behind? So quite comprehensive question. And then I will take the question by Ying Soheni uh, in a minute. Yeah, so I think there are two aspects which I'd like to answer in this question. Um, so I think the first aspect which talks about the digital divide impacting developing countries more than developed countries, I think it's only one part of what the digital divide actually is. So the digital divide isn't just divide the world um, in terms of developing and underdeveloped and developed countries. But the digital divide also has a number of other dimensions. So for example, there's a gendered digital divide within developing and developed countries. Then there's, there's different levels of socioeconomic digital divides within developed countries as well. So some of those came to light during my research. So it, it's not entirely accurate to say that this is a problem which perhaps affects developing countries more than it affects developed countries. It's just that the differentiations and the various factors influencing the digital divide are, are more than just that indicator between the developed and the um, developing. So firstly, that. And then secondly, as far as recognition of um, a human right, a universal human right to the internet access is concerned, I feel like when it comes to recognition on the international legal plane, that should logically be the starting point. And then we talk about and we worry about and we develop indicators for implementation later on. So recognition is always going to be a prelude to effective enforcement and effective implementation. So I believe that recognition is not just, um, it's not just happening in a vacuum. It's actually very important to start the conversation. And recently, for example, the uh, UN Human Rights Council, they actually recognize a new human right to a healthy environment. And that's 
hopefully going to pave the way for a lot of discourse a lot of different you know multi stakeholder dialogues for how to best realize this right and generally speaking as far as positive rights go as far as rights go which put obligations on the government to provide their citizens with something so as far as those rights go there's always a duty of progressive realization on state um in accordance with the state's resources in accordance with political will so so the duty is not immediate as opposed to civil and political rights the duty is that of progressively realizing that right and i think recognition is the correct logical foundational step towards that thank you very much um, i will now give the floor to uh, isabel uh, toman for to also look at uh, other questions that coming are coming in to the chat Uh, and later on, we will um, have some concluding remarks, which will be extremely difficult. But Pablo Chauke has offered to help. He's a lecture training uh, coordinator. He's also a writer, researcher uh, at the University of Cape Town and the School of International Training in South Africa. But before giving him the floor and, and moving towards the end, I would like to give you the floor, Isabel, and, and maybe um, ask a, a question by Ying or others that you have seen in the in the chat as well. Thank you very much, Elish, for um, moderating this um, not so easy back and forth, but we heard really, really great um, insights um, from the authors. And I hope we now have a bit of a more, even more interest to read uh, their papers. Uh, I see that Nordic Media is joining us. And Nordic, I don't know if it's possible for you, but if you would like to briefly uh, comment on the discussion and maybe on, on the question um, how um, higher education is actually important for uh, for SDG 16. This would be possibly the, the moment we could um, um, ask you to take the floor. And you also wrote on anti-corruption measures and you wrote specifically on higher education institutions in Cameroon. So uh, possibly you want to comment on that two or three minutes, if it's possible with your connections, if not, not, but we're trying, so. <laughs> Possibly without the video and just the sound. I'm going to stop the video and let's see if we can hear you better. No, I'm sorry, Roger. It's very, um, like there's a sound that makes us not understand what you're saying, like a background noise, maybe. Uh. Well, I'm really sorry about that, but it's not, we don't understand you, Roderick. Um, so I would invite you to instead maybe um, type your response and then we can pick it up um, as well. And of course, um, we have your paper in the publication, but it's a really important topic because corruption, especially in higher education institutions, is a bit of an overarching issue that uh, we also would like to, to address. So yeah, really sorry for that, Roderick, but it was not possible to understand you. There's just some, some background noise and um, there. So I would just move on to, to the Q&A because we have to be a bit cautious with time and we still want to hear um, Pavalo speak so we can give it another like five to 10 minutes. But there was a question um, from our colleagues from Zium University in Thailand from uh, Ying and it's actually on corruption and um, political disputes or when corruption and political dispute occur in every society, this brings injustice and youth stands against this and protests for their rights. Um, violent reactions, violent pressure can occur. So how can we, in that um, very difficult situation where such many tensions arise, how can we then um, still solve a conflict peacefully? So it's a very complex question. Also, of course, depends on the different actors involved and the national um, context, but maybe someone from the panel would like to respond to this um, exactly when student protest or youth protest, I believe there was one paper that did also address um, I think it might have been Mustafa, so I'm going to give you the word because I think you might have talked about student bond protests, um, if I'm not mistaken there, and if there's others that would respond to this um, 
particular question um, yeah let us know yeah uh, thank you uh, basically i include one in one part uh, how student protest has influenced the policy makers to change the laws on certain issues like on road transport regulation in the context of bangladesh and also in some other issues and i also connected it with the concept of access to justice because when we don't find judiciary as a proactive and as a neutral body to keep itself uh, and maintaining its independency and thereby ensuring that justice is properly served to the people the voiceless are being heard and those who could not avail to the forums in uh, in executives and legislatives they can get shelter by the judiciary unless such ambience is ensured then it comes to the protests and other uh, issues and here it happens with that uh, that unfortunately in our part of the society uh, world we see that, that that such peaceful issues are you know transformed into very violent and chaotic and thereafter uh, you know harassment of the people who participated in the pro protest goes on and all these uh, things happen because uh, 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 you know less than proactive rule by the judiciary but yeah uh, there are uh, instances as well uh, from the judicial perspective as well that the higher judiciary sometimes issues rule uh, uh, voluntarily asking different authorities to take measures on these issues so uh, i think uh, yes uh, i mean there is no way to give any solution to such kind of uh, complex and Uh, several, uh, I mean, uh, involving such types of dynamics in a particular problem. Sometimes they are being also alleged that uh, instigated by the opponents of different groups or different agendas hidden within the protest as well. I mean, these are the allegations brought. So it's a very difficult issue. But what uh, in my paper I try to argue is that uh, when things do not, you know. achieve through the ordinary judicial and other uh, uh, fair process then protest has been a, a way out to at least gain certain aspects and this is very historical starting from uh, i mean if you look at the independence history of these uh, developing countries the decolonization process all these have been gained through the, such kind of uh, you know uh, protest and such kind of movements unless today you uh, we, that these nations go to icj for example to settle their land and maritime boundaries so things are being shifting to some extent but le let's see how things goes on yeah yes thank you so much for for providing that example and i think we could do another three webinars on student protests on how this can actually accelerate change and it's very important because uh, the educational institutions are there for the students so if it's not them asking for for change um no one will i think i am uh, imat uh, i would give you the floor to respond also to this this aspect of corruption and student protest um thank you and i'm thank you so i'm talking from the experience of seeing several kinds of cases of uh, manifestations against corruption occurring in the environmental field whether being natural resources management mining in places where mostly it is sort of a dictatorships more than anything else where you cannot question the system and there were several case studies based on that and well when there is political conflict the best way the best strategy was to not question the political system but rather focus on the case so from i made so i've seen several comparisons between different manifestations and political movements those who were successful actually mainly focus on the issue at hand be it environmental pollution or anything else affecting this particular area uh whether it's the health or other issues while those who try to use uh the case no matter how rightful it is as a way to try to attack the system uh were not successful so in a situation where you have a political conflict it's best to always be scientific and technical and focus at the case at hand to try to solve the issue not to look at like as if you're attacking the entire system these were the most successful cases just to wanted to point that out Thank you very much. And I think um unless there's someone else who would like to comment on this particular question, um this is also a good way to sort of end a bit um our our discussion. Of course, we could go on a lot and I hope that all the 12 papers from the 13 authors will encourage a further discussion on these issues. Um because really it is young scholars and uh, we had um specifically addressed young scholars to to participate in this competition in this publication project. 
who are uh, coming out of universities who are who know what they're speaking about. So that's why it makes this a bit um, forms a nice um, conclusion here as well that we need the young people to push and to research and to educate um, and also to um, change the structures um, as we want. So now I would like to thank all the authors on the on the panel and um, also participating today. Thank you so much for joining. And before you leave, please stay for some closing words from one of our academic reviewers, because this project would have not been possible without the 13 academic reviewers from all over the world, from the UNODC and IAU network. I've seen several reviewers also in the participants, our colleague from Kenya, Tunita Tenia, and Dr. Talal from Qatar University. I've seen, um, just because I saw them, I saw that uh, Sevim Sadat and um, Samson Milton and Johnny Morgan, our editor, were also there. So thank you so much. And um, now, as um, as a closing of this event, I'm pleased to introduce um, Pavalo Chauke, who's a lecturer and trainer for um, um, the University of Cape Town and School of International Training in South Africa. So, Pavalo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, what an interesting and informative webinar. Um, I really enjoyed every moment, and I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that you're going to release the recording quite soon because I want to rewatch and re listen to, to the answers and to the questions as well because I think it was a very fruitful discussion. So, I just want to begin by saying hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for, for this momentous um, occasion of launching of the publication. What an honor and privilege it is to be part of such an amazing and impactful project with diverse scholars, um, activists and leaders from across the world. The diversity, inclusion and excellence in this book is something to write home about actually, because I mean, literally there's people from both countries and most continents and the racial diversity, the gender diversity is really commendable, I want to say. I would like to congratulate all the 12 authors um, for this unique publication with their chapters when they engaged with the research um, as young scholars from across the world. And I'm, I'm really impressed by that. Um, as, as I said, I'm honestly impressed by how you each meticulously engaged with the SDG 16. As the title of the book says, Higher Education Engages SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. To the editors and fellow reviewers like myself, thank you so much for rigorously ensuring and improving the quality of the papers because there was a lot of back and forth. Isabel can tell you there was a lot of emails um, where we were trying to make sure that the papers are of good quality to be publicized. So just know that if your paper is in here, you really pass so many stages um, of review. I just want to summarize a few points because I mean I think this is more than an hour and I can't say everything. If you want to go back, please get the recording and, and rewatch. Um, but I just jotted down a few points that I think were quite powerful and important. The first one is from Lulua. Um, I'm, I'm not going to mention names everywhere, by the way. I just mentioned it here. Um, who mentioned that there's going to be an anti-corruption initiative which is going to be launched soon. So be on the lookout. Just scrape the IAU and UNODC website for that um, initiative and be involved because I think let's try and change the world together um, as a people. Um, this came out a lot. This is a collaborative multi-continent effort. There's a lot of diversity in winners and authors as well, as I wanted to say, as well as editors and reviewers, and that's important. I think diversity, equality, and inclusion is quite important for UNODC and IAU, and it came across in this webinar today as well. Um, education can be used to enlighten and address ignorance, one of the authors said. Higher education can be used to advance rule of law and SDGs through engaging with communities and other stakeholders through research. Voices of the marginalized, oppressed, Young people and young scholars need to be heard and used to shape the future. We need to create networks and connections between emerging researchers and scholars to sort of enrich um, our research and, and, and our findings and, and way forward as well in the future. Engaging with indigenous knowledge and informal education is important. Governments need to be encouraged to be involved and see the importance of higher education so that they fund it and, and, and actually put it forward in their policies. The divide between developed and underdeveloped countries needs to be addressed. Intergenerational impact of history and poverty plays a huge role in what we are studying and speaking about today. Protests can be used to advance equality and transformation. 
Um, the first black president of South Africa, or the first democratically elected president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, once said, education is the most powerful weapon you, which you can use to change the world. And as an academic myself, I can testify to the power and impact of education, as we've also seen um, today, and we've all like witnessed um, the, the power of education together. I believe to achieve all the SDGs from number one to number 17, we need good and quality education, especially for SDG 16. And as most authors actually reverberated the importance of education in achieving SDG 16. At this time, I would like to invite everyone to read, share, tweet, Facebook, um, email, and engage really with the open access publications so that can be shared. The link was shared um, in the chat. If not, I'm gonna ask Isabel or Hilga to please share the link um, again so that people have access to it. Please read it, tweet it, share it, mull over it, because I think the work is quite important and impactful. I had a sneak peek earlier this morning. Um, uh, the link is just shared now. I had a sneak peek this morning and I literally went through the, the document, it's 180 pages, and I read some stuff and I was like, how can I not Tweet this, there was an embargo on me, so I couldn't tweet it, so I cannot wait to share with my networks, with my colleagues, with my friends and family as well. Thank you so much to UNODC and IAU for the opportunity to be part of this publication. And to all of you, congratulations and well done. And to the participants, thank you for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Isabel, over to you. You can take over. Thank you so much. No, honestly, I cannot um, top your, your closing words and uh, the great points you've summarized. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I think I'm going to give it back to Helige for the closing of this event, just to say the link is in the chat. Please do engage with us. We will follow up with all the participants registered for the recording and for the publication. So we see you soon again. Thank you so much. Wonderful. There is no way to summarize the discussions here today. And Leonardo Paradiso is with us as well from UNODC. Um, uh, together with all of you as authors, uh, together with all the uh, reviewers that have joined us today. Um, as well, I would like to mention the presence of Porn Chai Mongkong Banit. I don't know if you see him here in the chat still, um, Isabel. Yes, I think he's still with us. And you may promote him to speaker as well. He's the chair of uh, the IAU Global Cluster on uh, Higher Education and Research for Sustainable Development. And he has been uh, an incredible supporter all through the, the, the five, six years that he's been the chair of the working group on HESD. Um, and if ever you can promote him to speaker as well, uh, that would be really nice because he may wish to say something at the very end. Pornchai Mongkong Vanit is the president of Siam University in Thailand. Uh, he's also a, a vice president of the International Association of University in he is also the chair of the IAU Working Group on HESD. So if you want to say one or two words uh, to conclude also to say uh, with me that uh, we're very, very pleased to have uh, had the honor to work with all of you as uh, researchers on such very important topics. Uh, this is only a first time we meet uh, face to face, but through a little square. Uh, <laughs> we will be working with you in the future, hopefully also uh, face to face in other um, opportunities. And we've already been discussing with UNODC and internally at the IAU with Isabel, for instance, on ways forward um, in terms of uh, making the, the publication known or bringing you to events uh, so there's more in store for you. So Porn Chai, it is very late for you already in, uh, in Thailand. Thank you for accepting to speak, but maybe you want to say one or two words. In yeah, there. Yes, I, I also like to, to say that I have learned a lot and I think that uh, even we came from many countries, uh, I think that we have something in commonalities. I think that uh, one of the most important things, uh, important tasks of the university is to make sure that uh, we also promote uh, the democratic way of living and also sustainability. And today I'm also happy to see a lot of uh, good initiatives. So thank you very much. 
thank you, Bornchai, also for accepting to speak just like off the <laughs> un unexpectedly. And I also see uh, your exchange, Isabel, with Twitter Tenya, uh, Tenya, who is uh, from Kenya, from the University of Nairobi, one of the reviewers for papers and uh, um, a strong supporter of our work. Uh, he's as well uh, supporting uh, the, the work through um, engaging the University of Nairobi as the lead institution for SDG 16. And we've, uh, we've done quite a few things together already and very pleased to have the opportunity to have you with us. So if you want to be seen, you have to tell that to Isabel and she will promote you <laughs> so you can say a few words. In the meantime, Leonardo, if you want to also uh, have some concluding remarks on this, um, very festive launch of an important publication. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Hilja. Thank you to all the colleagues that have spoken before me. Uh, I do second everything that has been, has been said here today. And I want to stress once more the festive side of uh, uh, today's event. Today was a, a celebration of uh, commitment and to the fact that in 2021, almost 2022, after everything that each and every person has been going through in the past year and a half or a little more, we are once more faced with the, with the uh, security of the fact that in a world that is ever-changing and hyper-connected, nobody can do anything alone. So we are here today exactly to, as a testament to that, we want to, and I speak on behalf of the UNODC, of course, and all the people that I know, that shared the same vision as myself and as the uh, my colleagues in the uh, organization, the uh, building bridges on an institutional matter between uh, in the international community and the UN in particular with academia is the way forward for everyone to really push the boundaries of knowledge. We exactly, this, this is what we try to do. We try to put the smartest heads in the game so that we really try to understand better what is, um, uh, what is happening and all topics in, under the crime prevention, criminal justice uh, area and going back to the initiative that is about to be launched very soon, more closely related to integrity and ethics and anti-corruption. So this is really a celebration of this uh, feeling that we all share, that of uh, uh, working together to uh, understand, study and push forward the uh, mandates of our organization and ultimately the progress of our global societies. So again, congratulations to everybody. This is not a one-time uh, engagement. We do, uh, of course, uh, welcome every engagement and uh, communication from every uh, of the person here uh, in the call and your networks. Uh, congrats again on the work. It has been quite a ride from my side as well. And thanks to the colleagues at the uh, IAU for the, uh, for working together on this project. Well done to everybody and uh, uh, thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you.